Back when quarantine first began a few months ago, Emma and I took the time that we now had an abundance of to catch up on movies that we had missed when they had come out to the theaters. So fortunately, at that time, Frozen 2 had just come on Disney+, and so Emma, Emma and I watched the new Disney animated musical. And once again, as with the first one, my favorite song was sung by the tiny talking snowman, Olaf. Because he has a song in that movie where he's walking through this spooky, magical forest. And he is continually comforting himself with the refrain, This will all make sense when I am older. While alarming and unsettling winds and fires are shooting around him, he just says that when he's old and wise, he's going to have all of the answers. And in some ways, I laugh because I found that to be somewhat of a helpful reminder. But is that always true for us? All of us are older than we once were. It's not a profound statement, just an observable fact that we're older than we once were. Do all the troubling things of your past make perfect sense now? Maybe not. As we continue on in this year of unknowns and suspensions of the norm, we struggle to believe that this is actually going to make sense later on. I mean, we sure hope so. And we, we see in this passage, the disciples are struggling to understand what Jesus is about to do. What is he talking about, they ask each other. Have you had an experience where you prayed and asked, God, what are you doing? Reading this passage, you may ask, God, do your plans bring sorrow or do God's plans bring you joy? Well, in some ways, the answer to that question is a neutral yes. To bring us the joy Jesus is speaking about, often we're brought through painful sorrow filled circumstances. It's in a time of pandemic or even a time that you are personally experiencing and going through right now where I find it might be helpful to ask these three questions. What is God doing? What has God done? And what will we say to God? What is God doing? What has God done? What will we say to God? Let's look first at that, that first question. What is God doing? I mean, the disciples here are, they're noticeably confused by what Jesus says. He's told them in verse 16, a, a little while and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while and you will see me. So they're even whispering to each other at other ends of the table. What did he say? What, what's that mean? What's he talking about? Remember, again, this is a group of 12 individuals sitting together. So you can imagine that at either ends of this table, sidebars are popping up. Now, whether out of omniscience or the fact that the disciples don't know how to whisper quietly, Jesus clarifies by telling them of the sorrow that's coming for them when he leaves. His departure will not be a happy one. The disciples are following Jesus because they believe Jesus is the Messiah the promised, anointed one to become king and reign over Israel. So how can a long-awaited king leave before he rules? They think this is all wrong. You know, we might often quickly criticize or laugh at the disciples' inability to understand what Jesus came to do. You know, because for us, we know that Jesus came to die on the cross, to die for our sin, so that we might have eternal life. When we hear Messiah, that's what we says. That that's what we say the Messiah does, right? But for the disciples, they they weren't working with that definition in their minds. Because they had saw the work in their heads as the Messiah is establishing a an earthly kingdom. The disciples were Jews living under Roman occupation. 
They knew the Messiah would be a king figure. And so what does a king, a Messiah king, do? Well, he would send the Romans packing. He would send them out of Jerusalem. They believed the Messiah would establish an earthly throne in Jerusalem. He would be, well, the, the second coming of King David. They were beginning to see that Jesus was not just a man, though. He was not just a king. Peter knew that Jesus was the Messiah. They, they saw the miracles, yet they were confused by them. They were confused by his teachings. But they still held on hope that eventually Jesus the Messiah would sit on a throne in Jerusalem. Yes, they were a bit off on that, weren't they? They were right that Jesus is the Messiah, but they were off on what his mission was. Which, of course, led them to ask, Jesus, what are you doing? Why would you leave before this is done? When we don't know what God's purposes are or his plans are, we might grow fearful at what he does. Seeing businesses close, the economy crash, and seeing plans canceled or postponed was not the plan we had for 2020. More so, nothing we planned for 2020 has turned out the way we thought. We're now halfway through the year, and it's not what we planned. We have gotten to the point of saying, sure, why not, when another, another, another bad news comes our way. We've seen racial unrest and brutality done to our fellow man. Our Facebook feed is filled with violence. After a time of feeling safe from the spread of COVID, we're seeing cases rise. We're beginning to worry if things are ever going to be the same. What is God doing by upsetting all of these plans? The reason why it's good to ask, what is God doing? Is because that question right there, that question admits something. This might sound basic or elementary, but it admits that God is still doing something. When bad things start to happen, we may be tempted to wonder if God is still in control. I want to encourage you all to stay away from that kind of thinking. Because just because things are happening that we don't understand does not mean that God has in any way stepped away from us. God is always sovereign. He is always in control. So we should never say, God wanted to stop this, but he was powerless to do anything. Rather, God is always able to bring about ultimate good. We may not know the timing of what he will do or how he is going to do it, but we need to always trust that he is yet in control. What is God doing? He's working according to his plan. What is God doing with our sorrow? He is working in his plan. I mean, what do we do with this kind of sorrow then? Why would God bring an event like this into, into a world with so much loneliness and fear and anxiety? What is he doing? I mean, the important thing is that this passage is that Jesus is well aware of the sorrow that his departure will bring. His leaving them refers to the death that he will have on the cross in a few hours. He promises you will be sorrow, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Jesus promises that joy will come after sorrow. Not only that will joy come, but it will come out of the same context of that pain. I mean, remember, as it is through his death, an awful event, Jesus is bringing peace between God and us. It is through Jesus' death on the cross that he brings to heal the world and bring an end to sin and death. What did Jesus do when he rose from the dead? 
he began to undo the power of the things that frighten us the most. What is God doing right now? He is bringing us through sorrow and into joy. And so considering what God is doing, maybe it, it is helpful to look back. Ask ourselves, what has God done? Because when we ask ourselves that, we start to see, I think, the whole story. Now looking here in John 16, we do have the benefit of knowing the whole story here, right? We know what Jesus is referring to in this passage. When he says, a little while, and you will not see me, we know that this refers probably to his death, his burial, and the sorrow that the disciples are going to feel in that moment. But they will feel joy when he returns. So what, what is that time where he is referring to that, again, a little while, and you will see me? What does that mean? Because we might... We might think at first that this was referring to three days later when he rises again from the dead. And I think, I think in some ways that's true. He's referring to appearing to them again. But I do think that there is a, a fuller aspect of what he's talking about here. Because this is the same, the same speech where he's been talking about the Helper, when he's talking about the Holy Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit and the joy that they will feel, the joy that cannot be taken away from them, what does that have to do with the little while when he will see them? Well, there's joy in seeing him after the resurrection, but there's also joy when the Holy Spirit comes to them. Because when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, he has unity with them. He has presence with them. He is with them. The Holy Spirit is a gift to us. The Holy Spirit is also a promise. It is a seal that God is saying, I am not done with you yet. The Holy Spirit testifies to us that God will finish his work. This is the first thing to realize about what God has done. God has given us the Holy Spirit. That's what we talked about last week, but it bears repeating. Because when we are wondering what God is doing right now, we can look to the comfort of the Holy Spirit and that joy which can't be taken away. Through Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, the Father, we have continual access to him. We can pray and know that God hears us because he has given us his presence through the Spirit. Open access to our Father. Because through, though the death of Christ brought great sorrow, that death also was nothing compared to the joy that was going to come after. You know, Jesus then uses a, a curious illustration of a mother in labor. He says, when a mother is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Why does he use this illustration? Well, I think it's fascinating that God has designed us so that we don't remember the exact feelings of pain. We can recall that the experience is painful. We can recall that something hurts. But we can't summon and relive the actual pain in the same way that we can summon up a smell in our nose or summon up an image in our mind. We can't just bring pain back to us. And I actually talked about this with my mom and my sister, and they, they both have given birth to three children. And I asked them, can you recall the pain of childbirth? They said they can remember the difficulty, the hardship, but they weren't able to sit there and all of a sudden relive the labor pain. My sister said that, I think the, she said, the fact that a woman will choose to become pregnant again, knowing she has to give birth, proves that we do have the endorphins of happiness to make that crazy choice again. The joy of holding one's newborn child is greater 
than the pain it took to bring them into the world. I mean, there's pain. But there's greater joy that comes after. The joy of new life. You know, if any of you listening to me have given birth, perhaps, perhaps you, you understand what Jesus is talking here. I mean, I hope you don't look at your kids and think, were you, were you really worth the pain it took to get you here? Hopefully, even in your hardest days, you can look at your child and know that there is joy, joy over their life that can't be taken away. This is what Jesus has done. He promises that, yes, there will be sorrow. Yes, there will be pain. Yes, there will be loneliness. Yes, we will feel loss. Yes, we will be afraid. But he is with us. He has given us the joy of the Spirit, and that can't be taken away. He is present with us, and he is not leaving us. And we can reflect on that truth. When we ask, what is he doing? The first answer to that question is, what has he done already? God has already proved himself to know what he's doing. Because God is still on the throne. No amount of difficulty will remove him from it. He works through all terrible situations to bring about good. And even now, though, you might be experiencing pain and worry and fear, even in a time like this, God will bring you through it with joy, just as he has done before. So, I mean, I ask, do you have testimonies like that in your life? I hope that you can take time this week, on your own, with another as well, to consider the things that God has done in your life. Because I think we often might pray in ways that's a bit kind of like writing, well, thank you, like thank you notes. Where we might lift up, list off luxuries that we have and say, thank you God for this. Thank you God for that. But when I say, consider what God has done, I invite you to consider the stories that God is weaving into your life. To consider what, gr- what God has brought you through? Are there memories, moments in your life that were incredibly painful? Were there times where you didn't know what would happen next? Was it the loss of an opportunity for school or for work? Was there a moment when a friend turned out to not be what you thought they were? Think of those things, uh, that pain, but also consider how God may have used that event and woven it into a story of turning sorrow into joy. Call up or meet another brother or sister to discuss these experiences. Share them with one another. Because God may not have carried you through this, like Israel through the Red Sea, but rather... He may have carried you through simply by phone calls from good friends. He may have turned your sorrow into joy by opening up new opportunities. I know Emma and I have many moments of sorrow that we can recall. Times where we didn't know where God was leading us. Times where we didn't know what was going to come next and we were afraid hopes were being dashed. But God in his faithfulness brought friends to comfort. He cared for us in his spirit. And he opened up better opportunities than we ever could have asked for. Now, I also want to make clear that this doesn't mean we're able to call the evil things that happen in our life good. Just because God brings good out of evil situations, it doesn't mean that thing that originally happened wasn't wrong. When man means something for evil, God can bring joy and good even out of that. That's what the story of Joseph tells us, doesn't it? 
We can trust that because God, God does according to his plan. This is how God works. Jesus was innocent. He was the son of God. And he was unjustly tried and crucified. The fact that Jesus was killed under Roman law was a great horror. But God brought our great joy and hope out of that. This is how God works. We are surrounded by evil and sorrow and sin. And Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God, came to us. He died for us. And after that darkest hour, Jesus beat death itself into submission. And he reigns with God now and has given us great joy that cannot be taken away. That, that is how God deals with our sorrow. So considering that testimony, that truth of what God has done, that leaves us to turn back to God and, and consider what will we say to him? What is our response? What will we say to him in the next time when we're in the midst of sorrow? Well, let's, let's look how Jesus guides us here in this passage. Because he ends this passage by saying in verse 23, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, is he saying that we can ask anything in his name and we'll get it? Is that what he is saying? That we can just ask and we'll receive whatever we ask for? You know, a lot of people have uh, tried to interpret this verse in that, in that way and probably to varying degrees of success. You may have experienced that kind of frustration before. Where you have prayed and prayed and prayed for a certain thing. And God doesn't answer that specific request. So verses like this might indeed frustrate you. It is also in those times where we were most likely to be asking that question of before. God, what, what are you doing? So evermore, it is important to consider how we process this question. What does it mean that God says we can ask anything in his name? Well, it's, it's that Jesus is not talking about what we might get from him, but rather what it means to pray in his name. That what Jesus has done is given us access. Jesus taught his disciples to pray in the Lord's prayer that his father's will be done. It is in those words that we can ask, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray in Jesus' name, we're, we're praying for that same thing, that his will be done. Understand this, that he is saying here that the will of Jesus and the will of God are the same. What they desire to happen is the same. That's why he says we can ask the Heavenly Father in his name, asking that his will be done. And the truth is, we know what God's will is. That is the good news of what it means to pray in his name and ask that his will be done. Because it is his will to turn sorrow into joy through the process of hearts turning to him and relying on him. There are ultimate purposes behind events, and it's this, that he would bring sorrow into joy by hearts turning to him. God is seeking to bring people to himself. So when we respond to God then, in, in these moments of sorrow, we can pray in Jesus' name that his will be done. Let's pray for that. 
Let's ask for all this sorrow in the world to turn into joy. Let's pray for an end to death and disease. Pray for an end to all this social unrest. Let's pray that these events may, many would learn to trust and rest in Christ. We can ask Jesus for him to turn all sorrow into joy because this is the way that he works. We can boldly ask that God would do these things, turn injustice into justice. We can pray that he would take the sorrow of isolation and sickness and turn it into the joy of one day embracing one another. I must admit, I, I struggle to pray that boldly. It's, this sounds like wishful thinking, doesn't it? But isn't that what prayer can be at times? That we can ask for God's will to be done, and we know that at the end of the day, what his will is. It's to turn, turn sorrow into joy. His will is to bring people out of sorrow. His will is to show us joy, but that joy might not always look the same for everybody. The joy Jesus brings is not one kind of life. I mean to say that when Jesus brings us through sorrow and joy, he's not often bringing us into further wealth, peace, luxury, or ease. His will is to bring people into the joy of salvation, and that does not always promise ease in this life. Oftentimes, following Jesus might bring further trouble. We don't always get to see the full story play out. We don't always live to see our sorrow turn into joy and watch the happy ending here. But in faith, we can know that that will still happen in God's timing. And you know, that's, that's the hardest part about all of this. Because we don't know the timing of God's purposes. We think and we know that in faith that God is still in control, that he has been faithful and he will bring an end to this, that God's not done with your story. God's not done with you. Jesus knew that death would bring sorrow, but he also knew that he would defeat death. So if the Savior who defeated death fights on your side, know that there is no sorrow that can destroy you. He has defeated death, so no sorrow can destroy you. Because for us in Christ, even death, the greatest sorrow of all is turned into joy because we have hope of resurrection. The question we have is, will we trust in our God who does not change? And does will to bring us through sorrow and into joy? So let's put our trust that God would bring us through this because God does reign over all. Let's offer him our trust. Now, pain is so much easier when we know what it's for. The trials are easier when we know that they're going to end at some point. If you go through a grueling workout, you know that in time, the pain's going to end. You knew in the first place why you began to do it. You have your own motivation. You put on your shoes and you ran out the door. You put the plates on the barbell and lifted them. But in life, sorrow and pain is not something we can always choose to invite. Pain is much harder to endure when it's pushed on us. It's in those times where we don't know when it will end or how. It can be harder to see then what God is doing. It's in those times where it's helpful to begin to ask these questions. God, what are you doing? What have you done? And what can I say to you? Pray for the Spirit, your helper, to center you on Jesus and know that he's in control. Know that this is not some vengeful God who's trying to punish you, but it is the God who sent his son to die for you that your sorrow would be in to joy. God's working. While we might not understand it now, it will be for the purpose of drawing closer to him so that you can have true, 
unremovable joy. So let's pray to that God who brings us joy.